a nurse when you, people, you, I guess people dying start to become just the way things are. People being injured starts to become just the way things are. Um, and if you allow that to become personal, it'll tear you up inside. Um, being a policeman over years tears you up. Um, emotionally beats you down, physically beats you down. Um, but it's just rea your reality, just what you're a part of. I guess if you don't do it, who, who's going to do it? Somebody has to do that. I think a lot of people forget that when you talk about policemen. They forget that, I guess when you deal with nothing but bad things in your life, everything that you do, when you come to work, you know somebody's going to get dying, somebody's going to get hurt, somebody's going to try to kill you. Um, that's, that's your reality. Imagine that going to work every day. It's not about just seeing people die and get hurt. It's about your own personal safety. Imagine driving around eight hours a day, and just for an entire year, or maybe your whole career, and this is what you do. Your whole, whole shift, you do this the entire time. Every gangway you pass, you do this. Your partner on the side, if you have one, he's doing this, or she's doing that. Your, every, every gangway, every car you pass, every person you're looking at, um, I'll tell you what, <laughs> that, that's stressful just in itself because you always feel like someone's trying to kill you. And you know what? They are. There is somebody out there that eventually is going to take that shot at you. And when you're not paying attention, that's when you get killed. Maybe. Shootings that occur now, we didn't have when I worked the streets. I mean, yeah, people shot at, at each other once in a while or there was a shooting, but we didn't have drive-bys. We didn't have uh, a child getting shot from a stray bullet and, and all of those things that, that didn't happen. Um, so I'm, I'm not surprised when, when I hear it, um, not, not at all. And now I don't encourage people to become a police officer. It's not something that I would do today if, if I were young enough to do it again as much as I love the work. I would not be inclined to do it today because when I was doing it, not so many people were shooting back. I mean, you know, I was always concerned if I, if I stopped a vehicle that you have to be careful, the person may be armed, et cetera, et cetera. But we just didn't have um, gangs in the way that we have them today. It, it, it was just different. Today they're, they're shooting back with bigger guns and more guns than, than we have kind of thing, so. The police are in a tough situation. They, if they're, if they're going to be taken as legitimate, they have to use force very sparingly. The problem is they interact with, mostly with people who don't grant them much legitimacy, and therefore, what do they have left but force to use? To the extent that they use force, they have even less legitimacy. And so they're caught in this terrible situation of how do you, how do you break out of that? And so in very crime-ridden communities, the police are dealing with people who are the hardest to deal with. And so they're in the situation where they're the most tempted to rely on force to do their jobs. And the more they use force, the less legitimacy they have. And this serves to alienate them from the community. Unfortunately, the police are looked at more as a foe as opposed to a friend or peaceful or neutral. It, at base, best case scenario, police should be looked at as a neutral, in my opinion. Look, I'm not either for or against, I'm just for peace. What do we need to do to solve the problem? What do we need to do to stop the violence in this neighborhood? And as a policeman, you come in, and here you are trying to solve, you know, 10 years of problems in, in 15 minutes. Oh, that's not realistic. We all know that. But that's your, that's your purpose at that time. Um, and when you talk to these people, they don't understand how to, how to interact. They don't understand how to resolve their conflicts. You know, their only understanding of resolving conflicts is through, I'm not saying violence, but through anger. Um, they get upset. They don't know how to interact with people. Um, you ask a guy why he shot someone, because, you know, he called him a name. Uh, the reason uh, most children engage in violence toward each other is because they have not been taught to resolve their issues by, by speaking uh, or resolving their issues uh, simply by turning away. And all behavior is learned behavior. Unfortunately, you cannot learn good behavior when your dad is incarcerated for murder 
or when your mom has been locked up 19 times. Either uh, she is crack addicted or perhaps even mentally ill. And a lot of times some of these guys want to listen, but they're in a difficult situation from their point of view. Well, if I talk to you, if I believe what you're saying, Mr. Officer, and I put my gun down, can you guarantee the other guy's going to put his gun down? What happens to me when I walk down the street without my gun because I'm listening to you? I become a target. Now they hit me. Who's going to feed my kids? Who's going to talk to my mother? It's cold to say, but a lot of it is normal. It's something you see every day. I mean, it's unusual for you, but it's not unusual for a lot of these guys. They see this. They live it every day. I mean, some of those teddy bears might be car accidents that you see uh, uh, tacked to the uh, to the light pole and taped to the light pole it might be because of a car accident. It might be a shooting. So, I mean, you're experiencing this kind of stuff every day. You know, we got a guy on our place, Lord, his brother done been killed. Then he told me the other day somebody kicked in his cousin's house, stomped him out, nearly shot him, took his, took whatever drugs or whatever they had. And he just talking about, like, this is a normal everyday occurrence. You know, even though to me, and I heard, I'm like, oh, okay, that's messed up. Socially, and as my, you know, my background is in social work, and I done got this, you know, this, you know, this level of education that I have, I'm like, man, you know, that explains a whole lot about you as an individual and in your circumstances. Whereas, having grew up like that, I'm like, oh, okay. You know, okay. You know, because, okay, that's, 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 that's his typical day. You know, and that's a day, that's a day in the life of him. Because like I said, a lot of these guys and girls who are involved in this activity, a lot of them know right from wrong. They know better. But they're put in difficult situations. Even for me, I know right from wrong. I'm somewhat educated from what they tell me. But if you put me in some of these situations, and someone's to come say, well, next time I see you, I will kill you. I can tell you what exactly what I would do. I like to believe. I do the right thing, follow the proper procedures, call the police, take everything. But if somebody called and threatened my family, I don't know what I would do. Well, if you, if you talk to young people who are in some of these communities with, with violence, they really have no hope. And, and that's part of the reason, I think, why um, they produce these types of behaviors. Because if you really had hope that you had a future, you wouldn't be engaged in these types of activity. Uh, no one would be a gang member. No one would uh, put themselves at risk for an early death if they had hoped that they were going to have a productive future. So really, it is all about a lack of hope in these communities. Um, when you have a, an environment that is um, very violent, um, when you have an educational level that's very low, uh, when you have unemployment, uh, when you don't have any positive role models that can really give you a sense that you can do something different in your life, um, there really is no hope. And so a lot of these young people you talk to will tell you that I don't expect to be anything. I don't expect to live very long. And so if you don't expect to live very long, if you don't expect to really have any positive career or pursuits in your life, then why not be reckless? Um, why not do whatever you think you could do to uh, make your life better at this time, at least what you perceive to be a better life? If you don't set the next generation up for something better, they're going to do the exact same thing the current generation is doing. So I think uh, a lot of people need to realize that you can't arrest your way out the problem, you can't shoot your way out the problem. Sooner or later, somebody has to sit down and talk. You might not like what you hear. <laughs> you might not understand a lot of things that are being said. You may not have an insight into how some people are thinking. But if you talk long enough, you will. And I believe if everyone talks a little bit more, and find out what the real crux of the matter is, I think there is a lot of solutions out there. There's very rigorous um, experiments that are done to really help us understand what works to reduce 
you know, heart attacks or strokes um, or before a medicine is put out on the, the market. But in the area of violence, we don't seem to take evidence as seriously. There's lots and lots of innovative things happening, lots of new ideas, and yet we don't seem to accumulate lessons learned about what works for whom under what circumstance in the same way that we do in medicine. Well, we certainly know that violence tends to be a young man's game. And uh, there are many uh, teenagers across America who go through a phase where there's some level of violent activity that they age out of. And so uh, one of the real challenges that we have in public policy is to get people through those adolescent and young adult years when their violent offending is at its peak. Uh, if you look at criminal careers, uh, I've done some work on the criminal careers of, of drug users. And a lot of these drug users will actually commit property crimes for a long time. You know, if you're a heroin addict, uh, you're stealing car radios or doing something if you're a street heroin user and you maintain a costly habit and you have no ability to pay for those drugs. But if you look at the amount of violent offending by those offenders, what you see is it's really peaked in those young adult years and it really goes down quite a bit. You know, they're, they're, they may be stealing your car radio at age 35, but they're a lot less likely to be trying to kill you at age 35. And so, so age is actually a very uh, important factor. And one of the ironies is that the way sentencing works, we often really throw the book at people as they pass out of the phase where they're really the biggest threat in terms of their violent offending. There's a lot of you know, good early childhood education research showing that really the biggest benefits that we get for investing in early childhood, the, the big payoff really is in the crime reduction area. There's also reason to think that maybe as a society, investments would be better spent when kids are a little bit older and more clearly have identified that they're the ones at greatest risk for violence and crime when they start to sort of act out um, in ways that sort of demonstrate that, you know, getting arrested, starting to drop out of school, those are um, sort of behaviors that certainly indicate that that young person is really at risk. And so there's reason to think that investing later may also be a, a good strategy to really try to reduce crime and violence. Well, I think pressuring adults who can influence young people to make sure that they don't use that influence to, to get those kids guns is a critical thing. Well, uh, David Kennedy has done some important work in this. A lot of kids who commit gun crimes are committing crimes that happen because they're a 17 or 18 year old kid having 17 or 18 year old conflicts, but if they're connected to a gang and an adult in that gang helps them get access to a gun, then all of a sudden that fight over that girlfriend or whatever is going on uh, is more likely to be lethal. You know, I think as a society we really try to sort of assign blame. When a, when a young person commits a homicide, um, there are very swift and certain sanctions. It is taken very seriously. And yet we don't recognize the fact that how did this young person get a gun and, and the fact that they happen to have a gun had they had a different weapon the outcome would have been entirely different it would have been maybe a schoolyard uh, fight that ended up with you know kids going to the principal's office but the the availability of a gun really changes the the, the outcome obviously for the person on you know who uh, is shot at but also for the young person who happens to pick up a gun and, and I think it's very tempting to sort of sort the world into good guys and bad guys, good kids and bad kids. And, and I just, I don't think that's the reality. I think that um, some young people have easier access to guns and when a gun is used in a violent encounter, it's much more likely to be lethal or near lethal and, you know, get them involved in the juvenile or criminal justice system. And the same encounter could happen absent the gun and it's an entirely different set of circumstances. The life course of the person who gets into the schoolyard fight with the stick or the fist, um, you know, is going to get through that and, and probably without a criminal record. 911, what's your emergency? Station one, call. Station one, call. 824 mile. Station one. Be advised, suspect is armed and considered extremely dangerous. Well, the, the situation with gun violence in the city of St. Louis is one that really celebrates, uh, I think, a, a culture of violence. It's really a part of sort of the day-to-day the -day 
environment that many young people live in in the city of St. Louis. And I think it manifests itself for a lot of different reasons. Um, one of which, of course, is low education in the neighborhoods. And so there isn't a means to produce some kind of status through normal, legitimate courses of action. So if your education level is so low and you don't have an opportunity to really excel in school, to have a, a decent job, uh, to move forward or progress in life, I think in some respects, violence is a way of gaining status in your neighborhood. And so a lot of it has to do with that at a, at a very basic level. And then there are other reasons why I think violence is accelerated in some neighborhoods in the city of St. Louis. Uh, because of that sort of celebration of violence, uh, violence as a, used as a means of gaining status, many people carry weapons simply for self-protection. Uh, because the environment is such that I might need to carry a weapon to protect myself, to show that I have some status, and in having that status, you protect yourself. And then you have the added issues of, of violence related to normal criminal activity, robberies and gangs. And so it's really a, a, a mix of a lot of different factors that fuel this violence in, in some of these communities in the city of St. Louis. The, the purpose of street gangs is to provide love. The purpose of street gangs is to provide a sense of belonging. Our children join these gangs because they identify with each other. When five or six kids get together and they create a street gang, they have something in common. They have a lack of parental supervision, a lack of family love, too much idle time, and economic constraints. Those are the common threads of a street gang, and they identify with each other. And when they talk to each other, they realize that they come from similar home environments. And so, wow, this is wonderful. We're just alike. And so when they come in, they're looking for love. And so anybody that's willing to show them any attention, positive attention, showing them love, a sense of belonging, then they're interested. If you don't show love, if you show no interest, or if it's cursory, See, our kids understand if you're there because you're being paid to be there. They're bright. They understand whether you're there because you're being compelled to be there or you want to be there. See, if you want to be there, automatically they connect. If you don't want to be there, if you're being paid to be there, if it's a burden to be there, they understand those things as well. Part of the way they make themselves feel secure in the world is simply by accepting that they live in a, danger, in a dangerous environment where anything could happen. They have this a kind of a feeling of early anticipated death, strong sense of fatalism, there is no tomorrow, I might not wake up tomorrow, I'm gonna to get mine today. Part of it's that. Part of it's just that the life I lead is dangerous, I know it's dangerous. Now soldiers go through the same thing, that they know that this is, that they know that this is dangerous, they know that this could happen. And so that's, that's part of the, the way in which they're able to, you know, carry on in their environment and, and get through their day. And they use this kind of, uh, they try to create an impression of toughness as well, to provide themselves with some kind of a deterrent ability that, uh, so that they can advertise their ability to uh, deter aggression. But, you know, just like the fastest draw, uh, there is going to be somebody out there who's going to want to use your reputation for toughness and, and, and take that as a challenge. I'm just trying to think of the, the right way to answer this. Um, I think thinking about your future, thinking about college, careers, those kinds of things, in many ways is a luxury. I think a lot of kids who are growing up in, in urban areas, it literally, you know, is figuring out how to get to school, never mind what they're going to do in school, 
is a big challenge because of safety issues, because of the concerns that they have, because of what's going on in their lives. And so, um, and that's why, one of the reasons why I think it's really important to, to help um, ensure that schooling seems relevant to the lives that kids are living so that they can see the connections between why is it important today to go to school? Um, because it is, it's, it really, thinking about something a year from now, five years from now, um, is something that not every kid gets to do. They, they, they don't necessarily see the connection between why I should take the risk of walking through three different gang boundary lines to get to my school when, you know, I can stay home and, you know, there are friends that I can hang around with, there are, you know, ways to make money. Well, I think the first thing we have to do, because the situation has really, in some situations, spiraled out of control, you have to really start to suppress the violence initially. And I think the only way you can really start to suppress it and show consequences is you really have to really kind of extract those individuals who are the most problematic out of the neighborhoods. I think traditionally, and if you look across um, many communities now, um, for many years, the police departments and communities have said, there's nothing we can do about this violence. It's um, neighborhoods preying on themselves, young people who are involved in gang activity, involved in drug activity, um, they won't come forward. Uh, and so it's an endless cycle of violence that goes on and on. I think most police chiefs are saying, well, we know the situation, but the most important thing in terms of crime is, is not drugs is the life and safety, not only of, of people who are not involved in, in all of this violence and gangs, but the young people who are wrapped in the violence. I mean, people still have their dreams, they have their ideas, they have, you know they, know, they know what they want, they just don't know how to go about getting it. And what I mean by that, they don't know how to utilize the system and work the system. They used to be on the margins of society. I can function on the margins. You know, I know the process to go through to get such an age. I know the process to go through to uh, get food stamps and so forth and so on. But what I don't know is how I can go about getting it setting up for retirement. How I can go about managing money, saving money. I don't have that financial literacy. I don't know what it takes to own be a homeowner. You know, I heard of people getting homes. I don't know what it takes to be a homeowner. And so now. Those things that help me function in mainstream society, you know, I don't know how to do. I know how to do this. You know, I know how to exist on the margin, but I don't know how to exist in mainstream society. This may sound strange, but I would describe my job being like a very successful lung surgeon. When someone gets cancer, I'm great at removing the lung and, and hopefully getting the person a, 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 a good life the remainder of that time. But the real answer is not to have great cancer surgeons, it's to not smoke. And uh, the best thing to do is not to have programs post-prison, but aim at programs to getting people so they don't go to prison. Um, I, I think without any doubt the best thing that we can do is start working in the at-risk at -risk schools and start just putting in programs, mentoring programs, and asking people, if you could have any job in the world, what would it be? I've asked over a thousand people that, and I've only received two crazy answers. Um, one guy was mentally ill, high school dropout, and he said he wanted to be involved in industrial espionage working for Anheuser-Busch, so we weren't able to place him. But uh, the majority of the people have realistic goals, and what we need to do is just start finding out what people want in life and start finding out what barrier barriers are there and knock them out. And we need to do it at a much younger age, and we need to do it before they go to prison and not after. I think that the fact that children in this country can kill um, has really kind of given us license to say, you know, certain kids are bad kids, and you know, our kids are more violent, and um, really move towards a more punitive, both juvenile justice and criminal justice system, not because our kids are different, but because as a social policy matter, we've decided as a country, it's important for guns to be easily available. And one byproduct of that is kids then have easier access to guns and kids who have easier access to guns are more likely to end up in lethal 
encounters both as victims and as perpetrators. But I, I do think that that has really shaped the way that we look at, at young people. We're, we're, we're afraid of young pe people, and certainly we're afraid of young people who don't look like our kids look like. I understand that my primary responsibility is to safeguard the community, to protect the community. Our statutes in the state of Missouri are very unique. Children will return back to our communities irrespective of what I think and what the public thinks at the age of 18. And so the question becomes is how do you want them back? If you don't invest in rehabilitation, what we get, we get more sophisticated criminals.